Good to see everyone out with us this evening. Have another beautiful day to be able to enjoy. The weather wasn't as hot as what it has been, which was nice to see. This evening, I want us to take a look at the second part of what we started this morning, and that is a look at the impartial God. Just to review, this morning looked at the impartial God that we see in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, that God is no respecter of persons. He shows no partiality. And with that, that God has declared everybody under sin. And since God has told us that everyone has sinned since the Garden of Eden, when man separated himself from God willfully, he provided for us the common Savior. We looked at that, that he gave his only son to come and die for us. He gave us his son not only to come and die for us, but to be the word. Living word and then the word which is now written, inspired by the Holy Spirit after the son went back to reign at the right hand of the throne of the Father on high. And since the Father sent a Savior to us, he has extended an invitation to everyone. And that's the same invitation. That, it's the same invitation. Everyone's invited. Same invitation, same conditions of pardon from the establishment of the church to the present day. We saw all that. And point number four this morning concluded with us looking at all must believe, all must repent, all must confess, and all must be baptized. But as we're going to see this evening, there's a standard of conduct that goes with that also. Many times we revert over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, the last portion of that verse. Where Jesus says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. We look at that as the one verse that says that. There are many other verses in God's word that help us to realize that we are to be living faithfully and what our what our mission is, if you will, while in this life, of what the things are that we are to be fulfilling. There's a standard of conduct that God has given to us. Now, I want us to think about this. Man has many standards. We have standards in the workplace. We have standards for athletics. We have different standards for everything that we see and do as humans, but... What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7, beginning verse 3. Why do you behold that there is a beam in your brother's eye? But, or a speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the beam in your own. Or you'll say to your brother, let me pull out the speck of, out of your eye. And behold, a beam is in your own. Now think about this. What, what is, what's being said here? Saying there's a piece of dust in your brother's eye, and you're so worried about getting that little piece of dust out of there, you're missing the pencil that is stuck in your own, is essentially what he's saying. You have, a, you have this pencil stuck in your own eye, it's sticking out, it's a huge troublesome issue, but you want to go and over to your brother and you want to say, let me help you get this little speck of dust out of yours first. It doesn't make sense. That little speck of dust compared to what is sticking out of our own. We need to be remembering that when God establishes established the, the, the system of our pardon, the system of our salvation, it was everyone behaved the same. It doesn't matter if you have a speck of dust in your own eye or if you have the beam sticking out of it, get it out. There's no distinction with what God has us to do. There's no distinction in standards for, the, the, for those who serve in leadership, the elders, the deacons, the preacher, those sitting in the pews. We're all Christians. We all have different responsibilities and different roles, yes. But at the end of the day, Christianity is to be lived out by all of us. We're not riding the elders, the deacons, or the preacher's coattails into heaven. God does not make a distinction on this. He's looking at you as an individual soul. Are you fulfilling the standard by which he is set?
In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul writes, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all made to drink into one spirit. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, again he records there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, we all have individual roles that we fulfill. But when it comes to the end of time, God's going to look at us and look at us and say, Did you live the way I told you to live? Did you fulfill the commands I commanded you to fulfill? Did you go out and teach the gospel to your family, friends, and neighbors? Did you present yourself in a manner that your life was a living confession? that Jesus Christ is the son of the true and living God, or did you go out and live a double standard? What is the standard by which we live? It's the Bible. We study that standard. We study it, we look at it, we do, our, we do what we can to implement those things into our life to be as faithful to the Father as possible. Now, let me ask this. We're talking about there's a standard, one standard for all. Think about in the military. Historically, there have been that when they would go into battle, what would they do? They would take a flag, commanding officers would send a flag forth, a standard, and they would plant that. What were the what was what were the those fighting forces supposed to do with that? Were they were supposed to say no, come back, run away from it? No. They knew that was the standard by which they were to go to and to meet. They did not retreat. God's word is that standard for us in this life. We're in a spiritual battle. We're a spiritual warfare with Satan and his minions. The standard's been set. We do not back down. We meet the standard with which the Lord has set. It doesn't matter whether we're male or female. Or an elder or a deacon or a minister, a missionary, doesn't matter. We meet that standard. We don't back down from the mission that's been tasked to us, if you will. And with that, God provided a church. He provided one church, not multiple. Notice it's in the singular form. Christ came and he built his church. Notice here in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 18, his conversation with Simon Peter. He had previously asked him, who do you, Simon Peter, say I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And notice the reply that Christ gives back. He says, and you are Simon Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's in a singular form. Christ says, it never says it's anyone else's church to make alterations or edits or change the standard for. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. The church that he bought and paid for. The church with which he shed his own lifeblood to pay a ransom for. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, Beginning of this, some people will call this the unity passage. Others will say this is where you find the seven ones of the New Testament. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul records there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope. The calling is to become a Christian, become a child of God. That is our calling. The Lord calls every individual who's ever lived or ever will live to be a child of his. Be a faithful servant, to be a warrior in his spiritual military. Ephesians chapter 6, we read of the gospel armor. It describes armor that would have been used in warfare physically, but it's put into a spiritual application of how we are to be wearing it and utilizing that 
armor. Not only with that, but in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the Father has put all things under his feet, that is, put all things under Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So think about this. Again, emphasis that there's a singular sense to this, not a plurality. One church Jesus came and died for. Everything's been put under his feet. Not under multiple individuals' feet, but under the feet of Jesus Christ. And he is the head over all things. To who? To the church form. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. He that is Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Notice that he is the head of the church. He is the, who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead. He was the, he was the firstborn of the Father. He was the only first and only to raise from the dead, physically and spiritually. He opened, he freed us from the bonds of spiritual death. And when we meet God's conditions of pardon, he adds us to the one and only church that he established Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it's recorded that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice what it says, that it was the Lord added when? Daily. It wasn't weekly, it wasn't monthly or quarterly or annually. It was daily. Indicating that the gospel plan, of, the, the scheme of redemption Scheme of salvation is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just not on Sundays, just not on Wednesdays. Not on a day that we designate. It's whenever you realize that you need to make yourself right with your Lord and Master, that is the time to say, hey, I need to get a hold of someone and take care of this right now. And believe me, there are many people who have done it between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. And it's been on any day of the week. The Lord adds us daily to his church. And thanks be to him for that, that he allows that to happen on a daily basis and that we don't have to wait and chance being separated from him. It shows his impartiality. It shows that he does no respecter of the person, but he's a respecter of character, the character who comes to him in obedient faith, saying, I'm ready to submit to you. Lord of lords and king of kings, the one who reigns on the throne on high. And then when we come to the end of life's journey and come to the end of time as we know it, and the Lord comes again in the clouds, the Lord will judge in the same manner of judgment each soul that stands before his judgment seat. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 Peter records that if we call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourn here in fear. I want us to note that he's not going to judge us regarding the color of our skin, regarding our cultural background, our social status, the size of our bank account, our titles, or anything else. He's going to see souls standing before his judgment seat. And he's going to see souls that are either covered in the blood of his son or souls who are trembling, knowing they're about to meet their eternal demise. If that doesn't make you want to curl up in a ball and cry, thinking about the souls that are going to meet their eternal separation from God in that day, I would hope that you would pray to God for the softening of your heart. That ought to bring anguish. That ought to bring sadness. That ought to bring fear and trembling into everyone's heart. To think that there are millions who are racing toward eternity 
and will never know who Jesus Christ is until they enter that day. In that day, every knee will bow and every, knee will conf every mouth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then the separation will take place. That's fearful. It ought to give us the encouragement, ought to give us the fortitude, ought to give us the energy to go out and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, to everyone we come in contact with, to try to save them from that judgment from God's wrath. Because Rome, we read about this in Romans chapter 14, verse 12 that every one of us shall give an account to God. Think about this. Think about this. We all give an account to God of everything that we have ever done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul reminds us of this very starkly. He says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he, which he has done, whether it be good or bad. We enter, that, we enter that judgment day, we will give an account to our Lord for every action we've done. Again, we want that, it should be our goal for ourselves and as many people as we come in contact with to be covered in the blood of his son when we stand before that judgment seat. To be covered in the blood of his son means that you have the greatest defense attorney in all eternity coming to your defense that day. Father, the debt is paid in full. And you're hearing, enter in good and faithful servant. But on the other hand, if you enter into that day not covered in the blood of his son, you will stand trembling. hearing your faded words to depart from me. Think about this. John writes at the close of the book, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, he records, I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things, which were written in the books according to their works. Emphasis on, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Is your name found there? You know, in my lifetime, I've met some very interesting individuals. And at one point in my life, I met an individual who was coming to the close of his life, and granted, he had some health issues, but one day he made the comment to me, he said, well, I can't wait to stand in the day of judgment because I'm going to voice my opinion of how I feel about things. That was a terrifying thought, ladies and gentlemen. There are a lot of people who think that they're going to be able to go to the day of judgment, or they may not be there on the day of judgment. They're just going to be somehow miraculously pardon from that day. But I want us to think about this. Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. John records in that passage, he says, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? They're going to be wanting to hide from the face of the Lord because they know the wrath that is to come. Terrifying. What? You know, when that individual made that comment to me years ago, 
that they were going couldn't wait to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and to voice their opinion made me realize just how arrogant and how hard the heart of man can become and made me begin to realize even years and years ago begin to realize that like the song we song, sing in the songbooks, there is much to do. There's work on every hand. Hark the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Think about that. There is much to do. There is work on every hand. There is. We have, there, are, there, are, there are souls out there that are just in that condition, that think they're above God, that need to be softened and tempted to be taught before they step through that threshold into eternity. I want us to think about this. God is an impartial God, as we've seen. God not only reveals something of the character of being impartial, also tells us something about ourselves. And John, you can black that screen out. It tells us something about ourselves that we are, are all created equal in the eyes of God. As we've seen this morning and this evening both, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're all souls bound for eternity in need of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he who fears him and works his righteousness is accepted with him. God is no respecter of our human form. He respects the character that we carry with us in submitting to him in humble obedience, obedient faith. And as we saw this morning, and as I stated earlier, the scheme of redemption is the same for everyone from the first century when the church was established until the last person draws a breath in this life. All must hear the word of God presented to them. All must believe. All must repent of their past sins, turning away from that old sinful life, turning their will and their all in all over to the Father, willing to live for him, be willing to confess Jesus Christ as the son of the true and living God before mankind, and then continue to live in a manner so that your life is a living confession to that initial confession made before the group that is assembled that day and then be buried in a watery grave of baptism. Coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. Just not being sprinkled on, not being poured on, but being fully immersed. It's symbolic burial that we go into with our Lord. And we're fully immersed, fully encapsulated in that water. It's where we come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. That is where the Father adds our name to the Lamb's book of life. And the angels in heaven rejoice as another soul is saved from eternity. And then we have to continue to live by that standard from that moment up to the time we either leave this life or the Lord comes again, whichever comes first. Question is, where are you this evening? Are you washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and have wandered back into the paths of sin? If that's the case, if it's private, take care of it in private. If there's something you've done publicly that brings shame and humiliation upon your Lord and upon his body, you need to make that right and make it known that you are, have made it right with your Father in heaven and that you want the forgiveness of your brothers and sisters here in this life, do so. And if you're outside of the body of Christ, having never been immersed with the forgiveness of sins, the baptistry behind me is sitting full of water. But if you don't want to do it this, right at this moment publicly, wait till after services. We can do it then or any time during the week, and it doesn't have to be here at the building. Anywhere there's enough water, 
for you to be fully immersed will justify for a full baptism in accordance with the Word of God. If you're subject to the invitation of our Lord and Savior this evening, we stand ready to assist. The front seats are open. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?